You're listening to an Axe Church sermon. Axe Church is located in Camas, Washington. You can find out more about us at www.axecamas.org. Check out our other sermons and podcasts. You can find them on iTunes Podcasts, SoundCloud, and our website. This sermon was preached by Pastor David Robinson, who is the teaching pastor at Axe Church. We hope you enjoy the sermon, and we hope that the Lord blesses you through it. When I was a young man, I used to play football, and uh, I was a lineman. So basically, that means that I wasn't fast enough or good-looking enough to actually touch the ball. So they, they didn't trust me with all of that. They basically said, look, you, you go over there and push people out of the way so that the fast, good-looking guys with the ball can run and not get tackled. And so I said, well, do I still get a uniform? And they said, yes. I said, okay, I'll do that. I'll go over there and push people around. So um, one of the problems was that I was not at that time very large, not like I am now. Back then, I would eat food and it would just disappear. It would just go somewhere. Just like Hunter Croft when he, you know, eats, the guy eats like 15 Subway sandwiches a day and nothing, just, you know. But now when I eat, not only does it stay, it invites friends and things get, things get rough. But so I wasn't, I wasn't the biggest lineman out there. My job was to kind of push and knock into these other guys that were often a lot bigger than me, often a lot bigger than me. And so, and of course, your main job as an offensive lineman is to protect the pretty boy, right? the quarterback, um, because when he's trying to throw the ball, he doesn't want people, you know, running into him while he's trying to do that. That can be dangerous and apparently it hurts. I don't know. Never was good enough to be a quarterback. So, that was my job. And my job in protecting the quarterback was when there was going to be a pass play, I had to be there and I had to be rooted, grounded into the ground in such a way that no, nobody could get by me. It was, it was me protecting this guy back there from people who wanted to do him great harm, right? That was my job. And so I had to be rooted. I had to be strong. I, had, I couldn't give an inch, nothing. Now, one year I went to Western Washington University's football camp. Um, and I don't know if anybody go to Western Washington University, anybody? Oh, okay, good. That was, that didn't work. Um, all right. I had this whole joke I was going to do. All right. Well, I went to full camp of Western Washington University and it was, it was for these linemen. So I have like a hundred of these great linemen other than me from all over the state who are here. A lot of them are big guys. They're, they're strong guys and they're there to get better at being a, uh, at being a lineman. Okay. And one of these guys was from Auburn, Washington. I do not remember his name, but I'm going to call him Igor, okay? This guy was huge. I mean, big and strong. Uh, he probably ate, like, small cars for, for breakfast. I don't know. I mean, huge, mean, tough. I don't know if he's actually mean, but he was a very tough guy, well-respected, known as just a great lineman, you know, quite very, the opposite of what I was, right? I was very small for a lineman. This guy was big and strong and fast, and he would just dominate people. In these drills that we would do at lineman camp, he just make people look silly. He was a real bad bottom. My mom is here, so um, I can only say we could only call this a bottom when I was young, and eventually I think a fanny. So he was a bad bottom, um, and hey, it's just the way it is, you know. She's she's here. So um, one day at camp, we're doing a drill, and the guys, uh, the the basically the drill was. You, the offensive lineman would, st- would be here, and the defensive lineman would be on the other side facing him. And behind the offensive lineman, there would be the quarterback, which wasn't really a quarterback, but it was this big bag that, that sat back behind this lineman. So, you know, just a big um, bag that you would hit, slightly more intelligent than your average quarterback. But that's, no, I'm kidding. Linemen and quarterbacks, we have this whole thing that goes on. So um, there, that was there, and so somebody had to protect it. Well, Igor is about to be on this defensive side to go get the quarterback. And these coaches decide, let's get the testosterone of these boys kind of whipped up because a 100 stinky guys, athletes over there, don't have enough of that already. So they're like, who wants to face Igor, right? Like, who wants to, you know, because they're trying to pump you up and get you, you know, they want this big contest because Igor is obviously the biggest, strongest, fastest kid, and they want to see who wants to do it. So I said, you know, I'm not one to back down from a challenge. You know, so I say, hey, I'll do it. And uh, the coaches sort of looked at me, and they were like, no, I don't think so. I'm serious. They were like looking for somebody else. They thought it was going to be such a nothing challenge that it wouldn't be worth watching, and so they didn't want me to do it. Now, just 
for your information, when you're in front of a hundred other guys your age and you say, you step out, you know, kind of like put yourself out there and then have the coaches basically, you know, say you're too weak to do this. It's not embarrassing at all. Okay. Not embarrassing at all. Um, so maybe I shouldn't have used my soprano voice. Hey, I'll do it. I'll do it. No, I didn't. I, 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 I so basically I was like, no, I'm in too far now. So I'm like, no, I'll do it. So I step up to line. I'm like, oh, I'm good to go. Let's do this. Right. And then, so at that point, they shrug their shoulders and they're like, okay, you know, pipsqueak, let's see what happens um, when Igor eats you. Um, and so I, I kind of get down, you know, you get down in like a stance, I'm not going to do it now, I'm too old, um, but you get down in the stance and you sort of get, get ready to go, right? And, and so... Igor's thinking, I'm going to get that fake quarterback, and I'm thinking, I'm going to get these legs rooted in, strong, and I'm going to stand strong, and this guy's not getting anywhere. I don't know if you've ever seen those cartoons where the bull is like getting ready, and there's like smoke coming out his nostrils. That was me, right? That was me. I got that fixed, but it, it was, I, I, I was, I was ready to go. I was confident, Okay? I was confident. I'm looking straight in the eyes of this guy with no fear, like, I am going to show this guy All these people think that just because this guy is big and strong, he's going to beat me. I may not have been big and strong, but at least I was slow and awkward. So, you know, I I was going to do this thing. So here I am. I'm sitting here, and I get locked in. He gets locked in. The coach blows the whistle or says hike or whatever happens to get this drill started. And, I mean, normally what you'd do if you were Igor is you'd kind of try to go around one way or the other, around the person to get to the quarterback. But Igor didn't go left, and he didn't go right. He just came straight at me, and I was like, bring it on, baby. And so I'm sitting there, and here he comes. I mean, and we just hit, and we lock up face mask to face mask, shoulder pad to shoulder pad. And that lasted half a second. <laughs> and as I was looking up at Igor flying over the top of me to tackle this bag. I think he ate it. He just destroyed it. And I'm laying there on the ground looking up through two black eyes down a bloody nose. Not really. My face still looked amazing. It was just, I just uh, was embarrassed, right? I got knocked on my bottom. And (laughs) what I realized was that my NFL career may not be what I thought it was going to be. I started to rethink that, uh, that as a career plan. But the truth was, I wasn't ready for this guy. I wasn't ready for this guy. I hadn't done the work. I hadn't built the strength to be able to stand strong in the face of that kind of opposition. I may have been cocky. I may have thought that I could take this guy on. And I really did, by the way, think that I was going to win. Um, that's how, again, you know, how stupid I was, I guess. But I, I did not do the things that I needed to do to be able to hold my ground to be able to be rooted in, to be able to, str- to stand there. The physical power, the physical strength wasn't there, and my opponent ate my lunch, right? He crushed me as a result of me not being ready. If a tree wants to be strong, it has to have wide and deep roots. they got to go deep in the ground to hold a tree strong, right? Because a tree is not supposed to move. Right? They don't move around. They stay. They stay strong. If you've ever tried to move one, you'll know what I mean. They don't move very easily because they have roots. And the stronger the roots are, the stronger the tree is, the less likely that tree is to be moved. The roots are also how that tree gets water and nutrients into the plant right? by having these roots. Listen to what the psalmist says in Psalm 1. It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither, whatever he does shall prosper. But here's the other side. It says, the ungodly are not so but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Now listen, the godly, 
those who delight in the law of the Lord, the king, right, the one we submit ourselves to, those who delight in that, who meditate on his law, they're like trees grounded in, can't be moved, bearing fruit, all of that good stuff. They're not moved. They're strong. They're fruitful. They're effective. Their roots are planted deep and sure. But those who are ungodly, the wicked, they have no root at all. They're like chaff. I have a picture here. If you can see that, trees by streams of water, it doesn't look like you're going to move those. On the other side, that stuff you see blowing in the wind, that's chaff. It's like, the, like a corn husk, like little pieces of corn husk that would float away, or wheat when you get the chaff separated out. It just blows in the wind. And so the wicked person, the ungodly, the person who doesn't submit himself to God, the person who doesn't say, God, you're king, who doesn't drive roots down in to the Lord, they're like chaff. They just fly away with the wind, wherever culture is going, wherever way things are going, they fly around. This is why you have people who you know who 20 years ago thought very different things and were on a very different side of things than they are now. And if you would have asked them certain things, they would have said, well, oh, I believe this, I believe that. And now they believe something else. And it's not necessarily because they've been convinced by logic and reason, but rather the other thing you'll notice is that everybody else also thinks the other way now too. They just go with the wind. But the tree... It's planted, strong, it's rooted in. It doesn't go anywhere. And as believers, we're not to blow around wherever culture blows. We're to stand strong. Ephesians 6, 13 through 17 says, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore. Having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, we would not be told to stand unless there was something to stand against. We would not be told to stand, it would not be made a big deal unless it was hard to stand. Right? Unless there were things, there was opposition, there were things pushing against us. And we're not only told to stand, but we're told how to stand. This is one of the passages that does it. We're to be rooted. And our roots must go wide and deep if we're going to stand. If we're going to stand. So we're embarking now on a teaching series. This is sort of the introduction to our new teaching series. And it, it, it comes straight out of, you know, we were in the book of Acts for about three years two and a half years or so, maybe a little longer. And we walked through and we saw uh, Jesus with his disciples, these disciples who had witnessed Jesus resurrected from the dead, risen from the dead. And Jesus said, look, you're going to be my witnesses all throughout, through Judea, through Samaria, through the, the Jerusalem, the ends of the earth, all of you're going to go and be my witnesses. And then we see the Holy Spirit, Jesus ascends to heaven, the Holy Spirit comes upon the believers, and then they go out, right? They go out all over the place, and they start bringing the gospel. And then we see Paul, and we see him go on three different missionary journeys to all these cities, to all these places, planting all these churches, okay? So there's just new believers everywhere, all over the place. And then what we see after the book of Acts, is that Paul goes and he writes a bunch of letters to these new believers. And in these letters, he gives them the things they need to become rooted. To go from the place of the joy of salvation and of knowing who Jesus Christ is in the gospel message to being rooted, rooted deep. So we're going to study these letters and we're going to study the love that Paul had for Jesus, which is going to teach us how to have more love for Jesus. We're going to study the love Paul had for the church, for the people, which is going to teach us how to be rooted in love for one another. We're going to see Paul's prayers for the people, which is going to teach us how to pray and what we should be thinking about. We're going to see the doctrine. Now, some people think that's a bad word. Doctrine, that sounds, you know, cold and distant and whatever, and we shouldn't be so focused on doctrine. Doctrine is just what we believe. It's just the things that we believe, why we believe them, right? Doctrine is just the truth, the principles of Scripture, and so we're going to lay out a lot of doctrine through these letters. We're going to learn what it means to be a Christian, what Christians believe. We're going to study how the Holy Spirit through Paul exhorted people to let the Holy Spirit transform them and what that looks like and what we should be looking for. We're going to study how Paul's letters challenge the church, how they push back, how the letters comfort the church how they bring that peace and comfort. And we're going to see the encouragement that Paul 
brings to these believers, many of whom are facing difficult, difficult times, much worse than what most of us have ever faced. And we're going to see how Paul models the life of a Christ follower who's rooted and standing strong. We're going to see all of that. And we're going to see how a couple of thousand years, these letters going out to these churches in, in, in 2,000 years ago in these different places, how so little has changed. In fact, nothing has changed at the basis, at the basic place of what's true about who Jesus Christ is, about who we are, and about what it means to be offered salvation, and about what it means to grow. It's the same. You're going you're gonna to see as we go through this that Paul's talking to people in Ephesus or Corinth, right? And he's saying these things, and these cities are very different and, you know, whatever. But then you're going to see how it's, it's, it's the same thing for us. It makes sense. He's speaking universally. And it's an amazing thing that Scripture can speak so universally over such a long period of time. So we're going to study how these pressures and these difficulties and the joys and the hope are the same. And that there's much for us to be encouraged by, much for us to learn from, from these letters that Paul wrote. There are 13 letters that we'll study. First and Second Thessalonians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philemon, Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, First and Second Timothy, and Titus. Okay? Uh, that's a lot to get through. Took about two and a half years to get through Acts. Um, so I'm not promising we're going to do this quickly. But we will attempt to do it thoroughly. And if we do it thoroughly, we're going to become rooted as believers and Christ followers. That's what's going to happen. And so we've got to move onward from the basic things, right? We have a call to move onward from the basic things into more and more and more of the meaty, amazing things and sections of Scripture. We're not going to gloss over anything. And for any of you who have read these letters, you know there's some stuff in there that people are going to raise eyebrows at. But we're not going to gloss over any of it. We're going to dig into it fearlessly and faithfully and go into it. And Lord willing, by the time we've completed all of this, our roots will be wider and deeper than ever before. And the fruit that we will see as a result of that will be amazing. We have to be committed to it, right? We want to be more like Jesus. We want to be more like Paul, who was more like Jesus. We want to, we want to see what that's going to look like so that we're not moved. We can't be moved by circumstances. So we're not moved by emotional upheaval. We don't want to be moved by opposition or pain or even death. We want to have our roots so strong. And Paul wasn't moved by any of those things because, as the psalmist says, his delight was in the law of the Lord. And he meditated on it day and night. And so he was like a tree. Paul knew the word of God. He trusted Jesus. He loved Jesus. He stood strong. He wouldn't be moved. Just like his Lord and Savior, our King, Jesus Christ, would not be moved. That's what this is going to be about. Overarching theme here is for us as believers to become more and more rooted. Remember what Paul said in, in the 20th chapter of Acts. He says, and see, now I go bound in the Spirit, to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me, but none of these things move me. Nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. I want to be like that. I want you to want to be like that. Right? Ephesians 6, 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of of his might. That's what we want to be. We've realized, hopefully most of us at this point in our life, that we're not going to be strong in ourselves. I realized that when Igor ran over me, right? There's only so much strength that I have. And spiritually, there's only so much strength we have in ourselves. We need to be strong in the Lord because you need to recognize something. Satan wants to destroy you. If you don't know that, if you don't believe that, if you think that's a fairy tale, whatever, you're just wrong. Satan wants to destroy you and your family and your joy in Christ. He wants to run over you and leave you on the ground looking up through two black eyes down a bloody nose. He wants to tear you apart. Everything in this world and in this culture that's run by Satan is conspiring to shake you, to push you over, to pull you to pieces. That's what it's doing. Every time you just got done looking on Facebook and you're feeling covetous because you saw so-and-so got a new this or a new that, Every time that you're feeling angry or disappointed or depressed because of things going on. Every time you face financial difficulties or your spouse is being selfish or you're being selfish. I know that's not you, but some of us, right? Every time you struggle with temptation to live a holy life, Satan's trying to knock you down. 
Don't believe anything different than that. And those who aren't fighting, those who aren't saying, I'm going to root in, I'm going to stay strong, they're just blowing with the wind. They're just blowing with the wind, right? Just giving in, taking the easy road, right? There's a wide road, an easy road, it leads to destruction. That's the road that everything's, that's where the wind is blowing. That's not us, though. You have a better path. There is an adventure in following Christ like no other in the world. Real life, real life, not blowing around in the wind, real rooted life, real joy, real peace, real love. And you don't have to fear Satan who wants to mess you up. You don't have to fear him at all or culture or other enemies that might come because you can be like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season that can't be moved, that's rooted in. You can be that. And the wind can blow and the chill can come and whatever can happen and you can't be moved because your roots are deep and healthy because you're rooted. Jesus tells us a parable in the book of Matthew. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. In chapter 13 it says, On the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea and great multitudes were gathered together to him. So that he got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. This is not someone who sows clothes, it's seeds, okay? Sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth. And they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root... They withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then the Lord goes on to explain his, his parable later on, starting in verse 18. It says, Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what, has, what was sown in his heart. This is he who received the seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. So this isn't somebody who's rejected. This isn't somebody who said, nope, I don't like it. I don't believe in Jesus. I don't. This is someone who's received it with joy. But listen what, the, what he's warning about. Yet he has no root in himself but endures only for a while. When tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. The only people who had something good happen were those who received the word and were rooted in and were healthy. Every other scenario didn't work. And I know we don't want to be the kind of people who hear but don't understand. Or who hear and have joy but have no root. Or who hear and believe but allow the cares and the riches of the world to choke out our fruitfulness. We don't want to be any of those things. We want to be the people who produce some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. That's who we want to be. And to do that, we have to become rooted. These metaphors, have there's a reason for them. We have to become rooted. There's nothing in this life that is as wonderful, as wonderful and amazing, that doesn't require hard work. Nothing. You're not going to find anything in this life that's an incredible thing that doesn't require hard work. All the things that can bring you the most joy are often the things you have to work the hardest for. And let me tell you something. Being rooted and and being a grounded, steadfast Christ follower is a wonderful and amazing thing. And therefore, it's going to take some hard work. The miraculous thing for us as believers is the Holy Spirit is what, who helps us through doing that work. We can rely on the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is going to help us to work. So that's what we're going to have to do as we study these letters. I, I read them off to you. There's 13 of them. It's going to be a lot of work. You know, here's a couple suggestions. Bring your Bible with you. I know we put stuff up on the screen. Um, if you can read it, sometimes it's kind of small. But it's better for you to bring your Bible so, we can, so you can put some notes in there if you're that kind of person. Write down. Um, this is going to be a real study. It's going to be really serious. And if you take it seriously and you work hard at it, you're going to see the results. You're going to see the fruit. 
Okay? But what does it mean to be rooted? How will these letters in the Bible help us to grow deep and wide roots so we can't be moved? How will they do that? Well, number one, we have to be rooted in the Word of God. Okay? We have to be rooted in the Word of God. We have to drive roots deep in here. And, you know, we already saw earlier that when we were talking about roots, that roots bring, remember, water and nutrients to the plant. From, they're sucking up, they're absorbing nutrients. And the Bible, spiritually, is a place of incredible nutrition. It's scrumptious. Listen to what the psalmist says in 119.103. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Now, stuff that is nutritious normally does not taste very good. I don't know if you know this. I don't know if you know this. My daughter is a vegan. It's great. It's fantastic. It's good. It's very healthy. It's just really hard for me to think about eating that way, right? There's a big difference between the way I feel, though, after I've had a very nutritious meal, if I eat something like what my daughter makes, and me after I've eaten a very non-nutritious meal, like when I go with Pops to the Golden Corral, right? There's a very big difference in the way that I feel when those nutrients. There's a guy I know, a friend of mine, let's say his name is Buff Norman, because that's his name. (laughs) He doesn't eat or tries not to eat deep fried foods. Why? Because he's a communist, right? Um, (laughs) That's what they would say in Tennessee. No, he, he does it because he's trying to be healthy, right? He cares about his body. He wants the right nutrients so that his body will work the right way to do the things that he has to do. Right? So he makes choices about the nutrients that he's going to bring in to his body. Now, we, we can take the word, which is nutritious, or if we don't, we're going to take something else. And let me tell you something. There are a lot of deep-fried philosophies, right, and carbolicious ideas out in the world. They may taste good. They may be the thing that everybody else is doing. But at the end of the day, when you absorb them through your roots... You're harming yourself. You're harming yourself. They're toxic. See, the word of God is nutritious. It's literally talked about like it's food. And it is. It's food for the soul. It's food for the spirit. This is about your spiritual life. And if you're taking in good, good spiritual nutrition, you're going to have health and fruit. But if you're taking in something toxic, the opposite's going to happen, right? Right? You're going to be stifled in your growth. You're not going to be fruitful. So the question is, what are you taking in? Because you're going to take in something. If it's not the word of God, it's going to be something. It might be Netflix, Facebook, sports. It might be, uh, you know, bad relationships. It might be, uh, you know, alcohol, drugs, partying. It could be any number of things that you're sort of taking in or having, having the things that affect your life. There could be any number of things, right? It could be just the friends that you get advice from. And, and why you get advice from those friends, I don't know, because their life is more of a gong show than yours, right? And yet that's, the, that's the, what you're taking in. Those are the ideas. Those are the philosophies. That's what they're saying. It may just be, I watch a lot of Seinfeld. There's definitely a philosophy about the world that Seinfeld has. However funny it is, there's a philosophy. And a lot of people have taken it in. Right? Whether it's that show or another one or this book or that book, there's a lot of people out there who want to sell you something. And if you're not taking in the word of God, you're taking in something. Now, do you know that there are a lot of plants, plants where salt water is toxic to them? So if you were to pour a bunch of salt water on it, the plant would die. Now, here's the thing that I find really interesting. It's actually not toxic if it hits the outside of the plant, the leaves, the stem, or whatever. It's only toxic if it gets to the roots. Now, you have to live in the world. I am not advocating for anybody to go up in the hills in Livingston Mountain and create a bunker and get a bunch of those Jim Baker food buckets or whatever that last lasagna that lasts 20 years and, you know, whatever, and you don't talk to anybody and you get out of the world and you get away from it. I'm not suggesting that to anybody. That's not our calling, right? You have to be in the world, not of the world, but in the world. And so that salt water, it's going to splash on you, Right? It's going to splash on you because you're in the world and doing ministry and loving people and getting out there and making disciples for Christ is messy. 
It's complicated, and from time to time, that's going to come at you. But a plant, a good healthy plant, when the salt water hits its leaves and its stems, can basically shake it off. It can, it can make it go away, and it does not absorb, and it does not affect the plant. But if the salt water gets into the root, if it gets down to the root and you start absorbing that, the plant dies, gets sick or dies. And so what we absorb at the level of root needs to be the Word of God. What you absorb at, the, at, that, at that deep place where you're really putting it inside you needs to be the Word of God. And I'm telling you, if it's not, it will be something else. It will be something else. And so we've got to pay attention to what we're absorbing in. Because we want spiritual growth. We want rootedness leading to fruitedness. Right? That's what we want. It says in Romans 12, 2, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, not, con- not conformed. Right? Our roots don't need to be in the world. Our roots need to be in the Word. And if they're in the Word, we'll be transformed. Our minds will be transformed. Number two, we need to be rooted in relationship with God. Not God's out here, not I read a bunch of rules in the Bible, but in relationship with God. In John 15, Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. We're supposed to abide in him. Right? We want to be healthy, we want to bear fruit, we got to abide in Jesus, in relationship. He's our living water, right? And if we're rooted in the word, the first one, if we're rooted in the word, but we're not rooted in relationship with Jesus, it's not going to work. You can't have one without the other. You can't be the kind of person who you can quote me every verse from the Bible, can tell me every rule, and especially can tell me how everyone else but them is breaking all the rules, but can't tell me anything about the power of love and affection that you have for Jesus Christ who saved you. You can't tell me about your experience of relationship, of those nights where you're praying and you're begging God to move and to act because you believe in him and he's real to you. If you don't have that, then all the scripture in the world ain't going to do anything for you. So you got to be rooted in the word of God, but you got to also be rooted in relationship with God. Rooted in relationship with God. You've got to be rooted in the power. It's number three. The power and the strength of the Holy Spirit. Rooted in the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit. We're called to live in the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us that strength to stay put, that strength to stand. It is the Holy Spirit who does that for us. He's the one who empowers us to stand. It is the Holy Spirit who produces the fruit that comes from us standing. That's him who does that. The fruit of the Spirit, if we read Ephesians, sorry, Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. Against such there is no law. You want those things in your life? You want those fruits in your life? You can go find a hundred self help books. Go to Barnes and Noble or go on Amazon and start typing in those things. You'll find a hundred self help books. Oprah will tell you how to do it, right? All these people will tell you how to do it. Tony Robbins will tell you how to do it. But none of them are going to get you to actually have that fruit in your life unless it's from the power of the Holy Spirit being rooted in Him. You want those fruit in your life, you better be rooted in the power of the Holy Spirit. Number four, you be rooted in the love of the Father. This isn't just relationship with God. This is the love of the Father. You've got to see God. You've got to see the Father as your daddy. And many of you sitting in this room right now did not have good experiences with your biological, your earthly dads. They were a disaster. They were a gong show. They were alcoholics, or they, or they were violent, or they treated your, your mother poorly, or they did. I mean, there's a million stories, as you all know. And yet, you have a, not just a father in God, but a daddy, one that you can call out to. And, and when you have, when you're rooted in the kind of love that sees the father as your daddy, when you're rooted like that, your faith and your trust grow exponentially. Your faith and your trust because people, the whole idea of daddy is the, is the person who I can fall into his arms and trust that he will never let me go. Isn't that the whole idea of a child and his daddy? And yeah, a lot of people's dads failed at that. But we have a father who does not. 
And you have to be rooted in that kind of love. And I'll tell you why. Because as you do that and you love him like that, the faith and the trust starts to build and build and build. And there is nothing that will hold you stronger in place than trusting God. Than having faith in God, even when you can't see. When the wind is blowing and it's getting cold outside... Okay? When, when difficulty is coming, when the financial issue is coming, when, you're, when your spouse is going off the deep end, when your kids, you don't know what to do with them. When all these things in life are going crazy and you can't see what God's doing or how it's going to work out and you just have to trust. You have to trust that his will is good. That's where this one comes in, rooted in the love of your father, of your daddy, because that's the person who you trust. That's the person you have faith in. And you have to be rooted in that if you want to stand. Love your father, your daddy, God. Be rooted in that. Be rooted in that. Number five, the last one, we need to be rooted in Christ's church. We need to be rooted in Christ's church in real, vulnerable, accountable relationship with other people in Christ's church. Real, vulnerable, accountable relationship. Relationship full of confession and repentance and forgiveness and bearing with one another in love. A real, serious, loving relationship with the people in Christ church. A powerful, obvious, loving relationship that the world looks at and knows that God is real. This is what it says. Jesus is praying in John 17. He's praying and he says, I don't pray for these alone but also for those who will believe in me, that's you, through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. That the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you love me. What? When we love each other and we're unified as one, the world, that's those people who don't believe in God, who don't follow him, they know that God is real, that he sent Jesus Christ, and that he loves us as he loved him. That's, that's a pretty amazing thing that you can do just by loving one another. That's an amazing power in Christ of being rooted in love and unity in Christ's church. You know, one more thing that roots do. There's another thing that roots do. I don't know if you know this, but in the dirt, say, especially if you have like a hill, side of a hill, something like that, but anywhere where there's dirt, the roots, the plants that are there are actually what's holding the dirt together, right? The roots that are in there are holding the ground strong. That's what keeps it. If you've ever seen a video of like mudslides, destructive, right? Coming down, washing away, houses are coming down, whatever. Uh, That's because the roots, the plants, the systems have not been strong enough and have not held on. And there was nothing holding that soil when the rain came and when the difficulty came. And so you have erosion. They just generally start eroding away if you don't have strong plants with strong roots. So your strong roots... Your strong roots in these things are actually holding the ground together solid so that I can make my roots stronger. And my strong roots, as I'm making them stronger, are holding the ground solid so that you can continue to make your roots stronger. And that's how it works. So that we don't erode. So we don't get into the, the point where we're washing away. Because I'll tell you what, a lot of people are looking at the church from the outside and they're saying, mudslide. Not just erosion. Mudslide. This thing is a joke. It's off the rails. The hypocrisy, the craziness, it's all going away. But that's not going to happen if we're rooted. And right here, we're going to root in as Christ's church and we're going to stand strong and we're going to stop the erosion so that people can come into this place. And by this place, I just mean among us. And come to know Jesus Christ and love him and have the space on a solid enough ground where they can start to put their roots in. And the ground isn't moving. Christ's church is like that. We're a network, right? We're a network. My strong roots help you have strong roots. Your strong roots help me have strong roots. And our love for each other and our oneness and unity and being in one accord tells the world that Jesus is real. That God sent him. 
that he died, that he rose again, that they can be saved, that they can start to make roots. That's what Christ's church is. We are going to become rooted as a church through this study, through our love, right? We're going to be rooted in the Word of God. Rooted in the Word of God. We're going to be rooted in relationship with God. We're going to be rooted in the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit. We're going to be rooted in the love of the Father, our Daddy. And we're going to be rooted in Jesus Christ's church in real relationship with one another. And if we do those things, we study these letters that Paul wrote, which teach us how to do these things. That's what they do. And as we learn these things and as we grow and we stick those roots out wide and deep, nothing will move us at all. We'll become stronger and stronger. The fruit will be amazing. Lord willing, we will experience Joy like we've never experienced before the deeper we get into that relationship with God by becoming rooted and helping each other to do so. We stand here. We don't move. That's who we are in Christ. It doesn't matter what Satan wants to do. It doesn't matter what culture wants to do. It doesn't matter what society wants to do. It doesn't matter what your neighbor wants to do. It doesn't matter who wants to destroy you. It doesn't matter who wants to come against you because in the power of God and the strength of his might, we cannot be moved if we will be rooted. But if we won't be, if we're taking in toxins or we just don't want to put the time in, the effort, the energy, be rooted down, then yeah, when the wind blows hard enough, you'll blow with it. And so that's why we as believers need to study These letters that we're about to study. Ephesians 3, 16 through 19 says, That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Colossians 2, 6 through 7, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, So walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Listen, we want the Lord's face to shine on Acts Church. We want to see him continue to do the things he's been doing. We've we've seen it moving and moving and moving and moving. We've seen more people come to know Jesus. We've seen people baptized. We've seen seen the effectiveness of our ministries in the Philippines and in Honduras and in Alaska and in these different places. We've seen the people from this place. We've seen marriages struggle and yet hang on, rooted, unmoved. We've seen all kinds of amazing things. We've seen miracles. We've seen men with cancer not have cancer. We've seen amazing things, and we're going to continue to see those. And I'm telling you, the deeper that we'll push those roots and the harder that we'll work here as we walk through this series. And this series will go on for a long time, by the way. They'll go on for a very long time. And we'll take breaks to do a series on this thing or that thing, a few weeks here, a few weeks there, a skeptics thing, a marriage thing, you know, whatever it is. But we want to stay in this until we finished it. Lord willing, you know, I'm kind of old, so we'll see how far I get. But we're going to stay in it. All I'm asking is that you commit yourself that if Christ is calling you the Holy Spirit is telling your heart, this is what you need. You need this teaching that we're about to do. You need this teaching that we're about to go into, that you come, that you show up, that you don't miss, that you plug in, that you root in. As we go through this, and may the Lord bless us and keep us. May his face shine upon us, and may we become rooted in him. Let's pray. Father, Daddy, we thank you. We thank you that you're so good. We thank you that we can be rooted in you. We thank you that you have shown us the kind of love that we don't deserve and we can't imagine. Lord, I pray that you would just bless as we've sort of introduced what we're going to do here teaching for, for the next quite a while here at Acts Church. Lord, that you would speak to us in vibrant and amazing ways through your word that we might become rooted in it, Lord. I pray that you would protect us, that we would shake the salt water off our leaves and our stems, and we would not let it get to our roots, not let it block up, not let it toxify. Lord, all that stuff that's in the culture that wants to get to us, and our children that wants to defile, that wants to, to, to pervert the ways of truth, Lord, I pray that we would have strength to stand.
And I pray that as we stand, as this church stands, that we would make things strong enough that as people come in, we're able to provide for them through your power the kind of stability and safety that they need to learn the truth and to grow in it. I thank you for the places where, where you put me in life, where I was able to be, to be uh, cuddled and brought in and encouraged and loved so that I could grow and learn in your word and who you are in relationship with you. And I pray we'd be a place that people can come and that they, are, that they feel spiritually safe, Lord, that they feel comfortable, that they feel emotionally lifted up. I pray that we would build people up, that as we root down, Lord, we, that you will send to us all of those who you also want to root into you, all of those who you want to be your disciples, that we can be a part of a big thing because your church is the most amazing thing in the world. And yes, we're bold enough to come before your throne and say, we love you and we want to be used by you. We want to be on that adventure. We want it to be real. We want it to be serious. We don't want to play around. We don't want to play games. We don't want to be moved by the world. We want to be rooted and planted in you like a tree by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, Lord, let us have that fruitfulness of the Holy Spirit and let other people look at it and be drawn, not to us, but to you. I pray for those in our church who are going through medical procedures, Lord, those who are not feeling well, those who are at home, those who are struggling, Lord, we love our people. We love our body. I pray that we would come alongside those who need us this week. In your name, amen. Well, thanks for listening to that Axe Church sermon. We hope you got a lot out of it. If you did, we'd love it if you would comment or uh, give us a review or give the track a like. Uh, It really means a lot to us to hear back from people who have um, heard these sermons and have been impacted by it. So share your story with us. Share what is happening in your life um, that this is speaking into. And remember, you can subscribe to our iTunes podcast or through SoundCloud so that you can get all of our releases as soon as they come out. Thanks again for listening, and we'll be back with more next week.